एक ओंकार सतनाम करता पुरख निरपो निर्वैर काल मुरत अर्जुनी सापंग गुर प्रसाद जप आज सच जुगाद सच है भी सच नाने खोसी भी सच एक ओंकार God is one the divine is one humanity is one when I was a little girl, my grandfather would sit at my bedside at night and repeat these words to me, the very first words of Sikh scripture. He told me that in all of the sheer diversity that is this universe, that is this world, that is our country in our community, we are indeed one. So I begin with a declaration. I believe in the power of stories. I believe that stories have the power to bind us, to break us open, to make us human to each other. But I believe that the power of stories is dependent on how well we listen. That we ought to listen not just with our minds, not just with our spirits, but with our bodies. And so before I launch into my own story, I want to invite you to do something challenging. I want you to sense your feet on the ground. <laughs> you can hear the ripple across the room. <laughs> we have to be right reminded to put our feet on the ground. Sense your feet on the ground and let your weight fall to the earth. Let the earth support you. Sense the people around you. You are sitting in the midst of a thousand people who are here to talk and to listen. What does that feel like? Sense your heartbeat. Sense the texture of your palms, your chest, your facial muscles. Be present. And notice the glorious stillness in this room as we have a thousand people being present. As I share with you my journey, I invite you to notice what happens in your body as I tell you these stories. Listen with all of you, even as you eat. I want you to keep eating. And we'll return to our observations at the very end. My story is about a whirlwind. And the whirlwind first appeared to me on September 15th of 2001. I was sitting in my parents' bedroom, crumpled on the bedroom floor, watching the television set, the images of the Twin Towers falling over and over again between a mugshot of America's new enemy. America's new enemy had a turban. America's new enemy had a beard. He had dark skin. He looked like my grandfather. He looked like my family and my community. It was only a matter of minutes before we started hearing news of hate violence against Sikh Americans, my family is Sikh, Muslim Americans, Arab Americans, Latino Americans, Native Americans, anyone with brown skin was suddenly swept up in the hate violence that unfolded in our city streets from coast to coast, but the violence wasn't making our evening news. And on September 15th, we got word that a Sikh man was killed in Mesa, Arizona. His name was Bobir Singh Sodi. He was killed by a man who called himself a patriot. He was one of more than 20 people killed in the year-long aftermath of September 11th for looking like the other. When I heard this news, it hit me very hard because Bobir Singh Sodi was someone my family knew. It was like an uncle had been murdered. And at that point, I did something very brave, very noble, that I am trying to have the courage to confess in front of a thousand people. I ran to my bedroom, I locked the door, and I hid for days. And as you know, you heard my bio, as a student of international relations and religious studies, this shows you how much a bio hides. I looked at my bookshelf and thought of all the texts that I could pull down 
to comfort me. Can anyone guess which text I chose? What's that? <laughs> You've heard my story before. I passed the Guru Granth Sahib, I passed the Quran, I passed the Bible, and I took down from my shelf Harry Potter. I proceeded to read, at that point there were only three books, I proceeded to read all three Harry Potter books in my pajamas, in my bedroom for the next three days. And somewhere in between page 277 and 278, I realized that I chose Harry Potter, which is the text of our generation, of course, because I preferred the black and white world of Harry versus Voldemort, good versus evil, compared to the complexity outside of my bedroom window where Americans were killing other Americans. And as a Sikh American whose grandfather came by steamship from Punjab to California almost 100 years ago, as someone who found, who always saw herself as American through and through, it was a shock. I couldn't, I didn't have the courage to face the whirlwind that was brewing outside of my bedroom window. And as I sat there with a the book, I suddenly remembered the stories my grandfather used to tell me as a child. The stories of the 1947 partition of India, the largest, swiftest, most violent migration in human history, and yet my high school textbook had four little lines about the partition. I remember the stories of 1984, when anti-Sikh massacres consumed New Delhi and how my grandfather barely escaped, and that wasn't in my history book at all. And then I began to realize that the, what was happening outside of my bedroom window as, as I sat there was going to be unrecognized, buried, hidden beneath the anthem of national unity unless someone did something about them. And at that point I had the idea of documenting these stories myself. And as soon as I had that idea, a thousand doubts flooded over me. Um, I was only 20. I was a young woman, I was a woman of color, third generation. Why would my own community trust me with their stories when I've always felt like an outsider? I hadn't had a college degree, I had no film experience. I was the last person you would choose for such a project. And these doubts created a gulf of fear before me, a gulf that I could not cross alone until I remember my grandfather's voice taught me the heart of the Sikh tradition. Nam da nishnan. It means many things. But he taught me that for him, it meant in order to realize yourself, in order to realize God, you must act here and now without fear. And so with his words, I leapt. I leapt into the whirlwind, not knowing where it would take me, where it would leave me. And I'm here to report to you what the whirlwind was like. And I'm just gonna share you, with you moments. I'm in New York, and I'm standing at ground zero where the rubble is still smoldering, and I'm next to a Sikh man with a bur turban and beard. He's a, a young man in his 30s, a financial consultant. He has a strong Brooklyn accent. And he's telling me how he remembers running from the towers with thousands of other people that Tuesday morning and stopping to catch his breath when a group of men across the street spotted at him, pointed at him, and yelled, hey, you effing terrorists, take that turban off. This was before Bin Laden's picture was ever thrown up on our television set. Amrik Singh Chavla found himself running for his life the second time in 15 minutes. I'm in Queens, and I enter a bedroom with a single mattress on the floor, and on the mattress there's a man who looks like my grandfather who's moaning and groaning in pain, vaihikuru, vaihikuru, he says over and over again. On the afternoon of September 11th, after coming and praying from the Sikh Gurdwara, 
a group of kids beat him with baseball bats. He still couldn't move. A few months after I talked to him, he, he died. I'm in San Diego, and I'm sitting before a woman who tells me how she was at a stoplight in the weeks after September 11th when a motorcyclist came up beside her car, opened the door, held a knife over her head, and said, this is what you get for what you people have done to us, and now I'm going to cut your throat. Swarren Buller barely escaped because another car happened to have shown up. A noise went off and she jumped. I've lost my safety, I've lost my security, I've lost it, I've lost it, she says over and over again. I'm in San Jose and I'm sitting on the lawn in the backyard of a Muslim family and the small seven-year-old Muslim boy is sitting in front of me, his name is Samir. And Samir tells me how the kids at school call him Bin Laden's son and take their lunch pills and throw their lunch pills in his face. And he says over and over again, I'm, I'm a good guy. I'm not a bad guy. I'm a good guy. I'm a good guy. And if I saw those bad guys in front of my house, then I would beat them up with my karate. I said, okay, okay. <laughs> Wait, but Samir, how would you know if they were the bad guys? And he says, oh, they'll have turbans on their heads. Hundreds of stories like this thousands of stories like this. In the aftermath of September 11th, the FBI reported that hate violence against Muslims and those who look like Muslims increased by 1,600 percent. At least 20 people were killed, a thousand incidents in the week after the attacks. Some people think that the problem is over. Certainly hate crimes decreased in the immediate weeks after the attacks. But any time there were additional terrorist attacks in Europe, any time there were critical moments in the so-called war on terror, any time there was a crisis, like what happened in Fort Hood just days ago, we see hate crimes increase again against Muslim, Arab, Sikh Americans. When I return to talk to Samir about how he was doing, he says, oh, the kids at school don't call me Bin Laden's son anymore. This was several years later. I said, oh, good, that's great. He says, they call me Saddam Hussein. The face of the enemy is still held up in our social landscape. It, was, it wasn't long in my journey across the country that the camera spun 180 degrees on me and my cousin as people began to tell us to go home, to go back to our country, to get out. And as a 20-year-old kid, it was quite a way to come of age, to suddenly see myself through the eyes of other people who saw me as suspect, as perpetually foreign, as less than American, and therefore less than human somehow. And so it became my mission to tell people about our community, to share with people our stories. But I didn't realize that I was still missing the secret discovery the discovery that would help me realize how we can really change the world, how we can face the violence. And I discovered this one day when I was sitting at my university writing my honors thesis about the notion of stereotype threat, that stereotypes are embedded in our social landscape and our bodies can't help but absorb them even if uh, we don't endorse them. And as I was writing this, I said, yes, I need to go out and tell everybody else about the racism that they have inside of them. I surely am free of it. I was walking home from school and an African-American man approached me on the street. And I crossed the street. And I pulled my bag closer, and my stomach tightened. And for the first time in my life, I noticed how my body reacted. And for the first time in my life, I asked myself why my body was responding in such a way before my mind even said a word. 
And I thought back to all of those moments as a kid when, you know, the, the show, the television show, Cops, watching that over and over again when the enemy, the criminal, is a young African-American male and how those images were so strong, so in the air, that my body couldn't help but absorb them even though I had friendships that should have taught me otherwise. A few weeks later, I was in Nebraska at a church showing my film, telling these stories, when a, an old woman came up to me, a white woman, took my arm and said, Valerie, I need to apologize to you because after September 11th, I saw two Sikh men in turbans. Now I know they're Sikh, but when I saw them, I was, I was scared and I want to apologize for being scared. And I was just about to accept her apology when I realized, wait, I too have done this. We all have done this. That it's not the first moment that we have responsibility over. It's not our body's initial reaction. It's the second moment. Because in the second moment, we can go along unthinkingly to how our body is responding, or we can draw up on other voices, other stories, other faces in order to undo what has been done into us. None of us calls ourselves racist, and maybe we need to bunk that terminology completely. Maybe we need to figure out how to be aware of how we have already been wired, face it, confront it, learn how to undo it. These, the body's unconscious bias, how does that show up in who we decide to hire? How does it show up in the neighborhoods we choose to live in? How does it show up in the laws that we choose to support? How does it show up in who we decide to stand up for and when we decide to stand up? My professor, Atamjit Singh, wears a beard and, and turban like my grandfather. And his story presents to me a vision of what might be possible if we were resilient through and through. After September 11th, three different things happened to him. A group of kids came up to him with their skateboards, threw their skateboards at him, told them to go back to Afghanistan, and he barely escapes with his wife. The second time, he was on a train when someone was yelling at him on the train. He got off the train. The third time, the third time was different. The third time, my professor was sitting on a bus when a man at the front of the bus stood up, turned around, red in the face, pointed at my professor and began yelling, hey, you terrorists, go back to your country, get off this bus, spewing profanities. And my professor has learned to do what he has always done, quiet, pray for the moment to pass. And then something remarkable happened. The other people on the bus began to stand up. The white woman, the Asian girl, the black kid. They all stood up and they took this man's arm and they said, sit down, sit down. You don't know what you're talking about, sit down. And the man sat down. The bus comes to a stop and my professor gets off the bus and the man gets off the bus and the man comes up to my professor and puts out his arm and at this point, I'm waiting for the violence to happen. I know this moment well. My stomach is tight. I'm ready to, to cry. And the man takes my professor's hand and shakes it and says, my granddaughter was on that second plane that went into that second tower. I'm angry. I'm sorry. And what has stayed with me about that story is not necessarily the man's transformation, which is remarkable and hopeful in and of itself. What has stayed with me about that story is the people on the bus. I began to realize that we are the people on that bus. We are the people who have the power to stand up in the most ordinary of circumstances and say and do the most extraordinary things to fight for the kind of country 
the kind of community that we believe in. And they were able to do this because they recognized that all of us at some point have been seen as outsiders. All of us at some point share a common desire to be seen the way that we see ourselves. That I'm not alone and my community is not alone and the African Americans are not alone, Latinos are not alone, the Native Americans are not alone, even um, an evangelical Christian, a white man, straight, middle class, in the South, stood up and told me, Valerie, you and I are not so different. I too have been seen as an outsider. That perhaps our starting point in talking about diversity is not getting everyone to recognize our particular difference, but fighting to create our country into a mosaic where we recognize that each and every one of us carries a difference that we bring to the table. That each and every one of us has a stake in expanding the circle of who counts as American, of who counts as one of us. And how awareness of our common struggle is exactly what we need in the aftermath of crises like the shootings in Fort Hood. If you're a Muslim or Sikh American right now, you're scared, you're waiting for the violence to happen. I haven't heard anything just yet. And even though I know this may naive, be naive, it may be more hopeful than I should be, when I look at this room and think about how this wasn't necessarily happening in the days after September 11th, but it's happening now in the days after Fort Hood, it gives me hope that we can together, sitting in community, draw up the courage to fight for the country, the kind of vision of America that we believe in. So I want to invite you to return to your bodies. <laughs> Notice what the journey has done to you. And indulge me in going deeper. Go ahead and return to sensing your feet on the ground. If you'd like, you can close your eyes or you can lower your eyes. And I'd like to invite you to think of a moment, a mundane moment, where you too have been seen as an outsider. Choose just one moment and hold on to it. And as you notice what made it feel that you were an outsider, what were you told, what were you experienced? As you notice that moment, I want to invite you now to notice what's happening in your body. Where are you tense? Check how tight your chest feels. Check your palms. Check your breath. Check your stomach. And once you've noticed that, lodge it in the back of your mind and now I want to swing you to a different moment. Hold in your mind a moment where you felt completely and utterly at home. Where you felt so much love. And let that love wash over you. What makes it so that you feel at home? Who are you with? What impact does that love have on you? Take a moment and enjoy that.
And as you hold in your mind this experience of love, notice what happens in your body. Is your chest still tight? What's happened in your palms? Has your heartbeat slowed? Where is your breath? Is it pleasant? And if it's pleasant, enjoy it. And now I want you to think of a final moment, a moment where you are proud of what you did to stand up for someone else. Notice what you said in that moment, what you did in that moment. Notice the courage that it took to do and say what you did. Notice what made it so that you were at your best. And then be aware of what impact that has on your body. Notice where in your body you feel powerful. And as you slowly open your eyes, realize that you remembered a moment when you were seen as an outsider. You touched a moment where you felt deeply loved and at home. And you were able to build resilience in order to experience a moment where you stood up for someone else. And that all of you did this together. All of us have been outsiders. All of us have been at home. And all of us can find in ourselves the resilience, the courage to act. It's time to talk. <laughs>